Welcome to today's presentation of Projects from the Black Lagoon, Halloween special presented by Pacific Northwest Chapter of the Eros International Erosion Control Association. Um, I'm your host today, I'm Willie Nelson. Dave Jenkins couldn't make it today. So let's get started. All right, I'm going to start with the first project. This is a project that I didn't work on, Support of Seattle Project 1997. Uh, it's the reason that I got the job that I had the Port of Seattle for 22 years. Um, it was a parking lot addition to allow employees at SeaTac International Airport to park off campus so that spaces could be freed up in the parking garage for passengers. And uh, turns out that the parking garage actually is a pretty good money maker for the airport. So this is what it looked like before. And this is the original erosion control plan. This is the Western half of it. Uh, and I'll just point out a couple of things. There's a huge wetland at the base of the slope to the left. Um, the project entailed about 40 acres of clear and grub uh, fill um, and uh, cut and fill. The erosion controls primarily were sediment controls. So again, this is 1997. Um, and what's interesting on this erosion plan, I've presented on this before, but the, the main sediment control is a sediment pond at the top of the slope. And if you think about it, contractor would have had to build 90 feet of slope uh, or fill to be able to install this sediment pond. In addition, sediment ponds don't do anything to reduce turbidity enough to be able to discharge your water under the construction stormwater general permit. So kind of, uh, kind of a useless plan, unfortunately. This is what it looked like um, about a month and a half into construction. And this is what it looked like uh, three or four months into construction after several rainstorms, but nothing very large, um, nothing that even exceeded, I don't think the two year storm event, which is what the sediment pond was designed to contain. So just typical small, low intensity storms in the Pacific Northwest. Construction halted, of course, and you can see the guy down here filling sandbags. Um, looks like two or three 21,000 gallon tanks have been brought on site for additional storage. Um, looks like the concrete stormwater vault on the back edge has been installed. So um, things are kind of halted. They're just trying to manage the site at this point. Here's looking down toward the wetland that I showed on the mention on the plans. And here's doing some cleanup of all that muck. I don't know how much got into the wetland itself, but across the freeway uh, from this project is a big regional detention facility, stormwater facility. And uh, quite a bit of the mud sediment ended up over there, which led to a big cleanup um, and a cost to the port. So it did get finished. Here is what it looked like. Um, this is 2002. Now, what happened on this project? Well, a lot of scary stuff happened on this project, which is why I included it. The um, final bid package wasn't complete until mid-June of 97. The contractor didn't sign uh, until the end of June. They submitted their erosion plan um, it was submitted in two, within two weeks of signing, uh, and it took a week for comments back from the port. Work didn't start until August. So working in the Pacific Northwest, you know that doing a 40 acre, several hundred thousand cubic yard fill uh, starting in August is not a good way to go. Um, another scary thing is the contract specs. The um, um, erosion specs were written so that 
anything related to compliance was considered incidental and included in payments for other bid items, such as earthwork, um, things like that. So really the erosion controls got buried in the contract, which is okay on a small job, but on a big dirt job, um, it doesn't provide much incentive to the contractor to, to really um, jump on things. So if they know that they're not gonna get paid directly, they had to bid it. So if anything comes up, they couldn't have imagined then um, cost is on them. Another um, horrific thing that was done, you can see the uh, bid schedule here. All of these things are sediment controls, straw bale barriers, silt fence, quarry spalls, riprap, um, all pretty old school actually. Sediment pond maintenance, the port set a, an allowance of $2,000 for that. So you can imagine going into fall rainy season and knowing you're gonna to have to clean mud out of a pond and there's $2,000 to do it. But what's really interesting is the uh, erosion control measures force account set by the port at $40,000, which I'm sure that at the end of all this port wished they had put several hundred thousand dollars in. And then I think my favorite spec I've ever seen is this one. Um, Contractors show phase clearing and grading activity so that uh, they expose the least area of soil for the shortest possible time. Again, you have 75 days to complete the major earthwork. You're 40 acres, several hundred thousand cubic yards. It is impossible to expose the least area of soil for the shortest possible time. You have to get in there and rip and tear and open everything up to do this. Unfortunately, at the, at the time the port was obtaining, trying to obtain permits to fill wetlands so that they could build a very large fill to build a third runway at the airport. So this required somewhere, somewhere between uh, 18 and 26 million cubic yards of soil. I've never gotten an exact number. I don't know if anybody actually knows the exact number, but the surrounding com community did not want this thing built. So um, this is one of the comments to the local newspaper. If they can't manage a simple parking lot project, how can we trust them with 26 million cubic yards of fill for third runway? Uh, port was fined for this project, not a huge amount, but what did cost quite a bit was the changes required in the port's environmental and construction programs so that this never happened again. And the political will had changed um, in the, with the port managers and the elected commission. And the, the word was, this will never happen again. So that changed the entire culture of the port for the good and actually led to the job I, I had before I retired. Okay, next project. This was not one of my projects. It's one I became aware of. Uh, I think everybody in the Seattle, general Seattle region became aware of this project. This was a private development. Uh, this is what the area looked like in 2005. And uh, sure I'm thankful for Google Earth. It's awesome. Here we are. They've obtained permission, or not permission, they have obtained their construction stormwater general permit to begin construction. Um, this is what it looked like in October, 2006. I think at this point, it's probably a 20 acre project, but it looks pretty, doesn't look very uh, controlled here. This is November, 2007, and uh, this is interesting. So they're, they're filling, but look how they've sloped. They've sloped this layer to the face and you can see the gullies forming along here. So they've already got problems. There's, I don't think they have this paved yet. And you can see dirt and mud and such down here. This area up in here looks interesting. So that's November, that's a year into this. Uh, two years later, you can see this is all eroded in here, this whole slope. Uh, they've had problems, more problems with this slope. They did cut in some trenches and put in some ponds up here but then they've also added the area to the left and it kind of looks like it's not graded 
properly. They're really not thinking about where water is going to go, which is critical. Um, fortunately, there were two major slides that closed a very busy highway. A lot of people were not happy about that. This is what it looked like in 2010. So one of the slides came down through here. You can see the silt fence at the base. And over here uh, was the other slide, this whole area down here slid. Uh, still having problems on the slopes in here, sediment, things like that. 2010, uh, by this time actually, uh, they've already been put under enforcement orders by Department of Ecology for uh, slides and other stuff, a lot of other stuff. So it just is not a very well managed site. Uh, August 2011, you can see here's where this, the slides were actually, uh, slides occurred in, in uh, uh, winter of 20, or excuse me, 2011. So again, this was one of the slides here and this is one of the slides. Apparently two months later it rained and they hadn't covered these slopes. And then what happened? Well, let me uh, read something here. A prominent Washington developer and his com construction company pleaded guilty in US District Court in Tacoma to felony violations of the Clean Water Act. This was the first stormwater pollution criminal charge brought in Western Washington. Um, the company and the owner paid a total of $750,000 fines. The owner went to federal prison for six months, uh, which made him a felon. And as well as the employee who was falsifying records, uh, inspection records under the construction stormwater general permit, um, they pled down to 12 months uh, probation, no fine, which also made him a felon. So as they say in Montana, that's a rough break but uh, it, unfortunately, by that time, 2006, I don't think there was a contractor anywhere in the Puget Sound region that didn't know that uh, this kind of construction work was old school and not going to be acceptable. So this is what it looked like last year, August 20. So they finally got something built on it. So, uh, you know, my, my imag I imagine that the contractor, the developer thought they would save money by doing this project the way they did. And it cost them quite a bit, obviously. So I saw that movie when it came out, I think I was 10 and I was horrified. I had nightmares seeing the birds. It's pretty, pretty awesome, old school, but pretty awesome. All right, now I'm gonna to jump to a project not too far from my house. It's an 80 acre parcel that was, I think it, it was family owned. They wanted to develop it. They had trouble doing that. So they sold it for a pretty low price. Guy bought it and uh, got his permits and started work in 2019. So this is May. Uh, you can see they've cleared and grubbed the entire site. Um, con I, I know the contractor that was hired to do the earthwork and they're, probably the best earth mover um, around, at least around this area, possibly the Northwest. And uh, this even worried them because the developer had no intention of installing erosion controls and this uh, contractor uh, sub that did the earthwork on their own dime, put in silt fence on the perimeter and a few other places. Um, it, they were so, so uh, scared on this job and they cleared out as soon as they were done. Anyway, so 2019, this is October 2019, so not much has happened. It's still completely open. Uh, you can see the building lots have been um, graded. No roads, no pavement, anything like that. Uh, it's interesting to note that right away the rain started and they started having trouble. Pond, this pond uh, filled to overflow and there's a pond back here that filled to over, overflow. The, uh, I believe the homeowners here, there's a couple houses and a couple houses back here were actually evacuated because of the fear of uh, massive pond failure. Consequently, I'm jumping ahead here, consequently, Department of Ecology and uh, the city shut them down 
and told them uh, you can't can't touch it except to do erosion control work. Um, I think I don't know if they it, it ever went through, but Ecology had fined them two hundred fifty thousand dollars. This is what it looked like when I found out about it, uh, probably February of twenty twenty. So this is the lower entrance to the project. Uh, this is okay. So August twenty twenty. Um, you can see they've got some roads in, some asphalt, no houses yet. This is because the city then allowed them to put in the roads, curbs, gutters, sidewalks, um, and erosion control and nothing else. So a year later, June 2021, here's the roads, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, no houses yet, 80 acres. Um, pretty bare. So now we're two years into this thing. Here's what it looked like last weekend. This is the lower entrance where that silt fence was uh, installed across the dirt road. Finally starting to build some houses. Um, the, pro the property was sold to a very large national developer who does generally a really good job on uh, erosion control and environmental issues. So they were very savvy. They knew what needed to be done. So you can see they installed blankets over hyperseed here and re-up the silt fence. We've got an asphalt berm up here di directing water. So doing a nice job. Again, this is last weekend. This is the only model home they have built so far and it's the, the yard isn't complete. So um, this thing is just, you know, it's two years and here's another view of some of the houses down in the lower end that they've started building. But this thing cannot be generating income yet. So uh, just a real fiasco. I don't know what this costs somebody or a lot of people uh, before we move on and jump back. So um, what I've always wondered, and, and I've never seen the grading plans, so I don't know what was possible, but if this thing had been split up into 20 acre, 25 acre areas, so I th what they've got finished here, you know, if it was possible to just get this done and start building houses. They could have potentially started building houses two years ago. Um, you know, it's kind of one of my philosophies is when you're doing a big project like this, um, if you can split it up, you know, clear and grub sections at a time, get it done enough so you can start building and generating um, income and then phase it, you know, continue as, as, you, as you can in the right time of year. So would have saved this, this uh, original developer a lot of hassle. All right, so next project. I don't remember which one is coming up. This might be my personal horror story. Yes, it is. I love those old movies. Okay, so this is my personal um, horror story. This is the one that kept me up nights um, and uh, probably drinking more whiskey than I should have. And this project wasn't, the, the horror wasn't because of erosion control or stormwater. They had, they did a really good job on that. They had a tremendous um, tire wash system. We didn't ever had track out on this. This is the dedicated tire wash operator. And um, we also had, this is on an inter intertidal river. And it was, uh, we got permission to do this work in the summertime to, to use the daytime low tides, but it's also when salmon were running. So we had to be really careful with what we were doing. Uh, we had a turbidity curtain and then we were allowed, as long as we covered up everything before tide came back, uh, we were good. We had to maintain a two foot vertical or a six foot horizontal separation from the tide at any given time. So we learned to you know, start working from the top down as the tide's going out do what we needed to do and then cover as the tide's coming back in, keep work, work our way out, cover it. So this worked really well. You see the fish net there too. We had a little bit of a problem with a salmon, one salmon turned out. So here's some of the area being covered before the tide's coming up and trenched in. This is real heavy geotextile fabric. So they did a really good erosion control job. This is the area in that last slide over here where the fabric's hanging over and tides come back up. Anyway, so what is this job? This is a super fun site. This was an old asphalt shingle manufacturer 
Um, and the site was very contaminated with PCBs and dioxins and other nasty stuff. So what made this thing a horror? Uh, it, it was primarily this. So several hundred uh, test pits and, and boreholes were, were drilled and driven to determine the extent of contamination, the depth of contamination, and how contaminated areas were. And with that information, the designer came up with polygons uh, showing you know, corner extents or edge extents and then elevations to clean up too. So this Dallas Avenue here is, is uh, right at 22, 23 feet. Let me admit somebody here, there we go. Uh, so the elevation is about 22, 23 feet above uh, um, sea level. I, I think that's the datum, I, I don't know exactly. So any of these numbers you see are the elevation above sea level or subtract the number from the 22 or 23. So for example, uh, right along the road of the, the edge road here, we've got 17 feet. So we have to dig down five feet. Then we sample, we have to leave it open, sample, get our test results back. So each one of these areas we had to do that with. Um, in some areas, it wasn't really too big a problem, like up in the north end here. Uh, high tide generally is plus 12, 13 max. So you're digging down to 17, you're above high tide, you're fine. But along the edges here, we've got seven, eight, six. So this is well below high tide. Um, and then we had to uh, install sheet pile because we had to dig down to zero. Um, so 22, 23 feet below the road surface. And um, we had to, of course, dig it. We couldn't, couldn't dig at low tide. So that was, a, that was a real challenge. And then you can see these areas 10, 10, 8, 1. We had sheet pile around this one. So each of these areas was different. So you had to think about shoring. Uh, you know, are you going to shore it? You're going to do cutback slopes, things like that. But you also had to think about what happened if you, if you cut down to an elevation what was gonna happen. So in this area, the contractor hadn't thought about it and they were gonna start digging down to 10, which meant that all of these areas in here were gonna flood at high tide, um, which is a problem on a contaminated site. So it just required a lot of thought and a lot of phasing and really thinking about what you're doing ahead of time. So that's what made this thing. I'd wake up at three in the morning frequently with a flash of what needed to be done on it. So this is what it looked like just before we started. It was all paved. Uh, this is during, this is several months into it. You can see the sheet pile down here. Um, we had a construction stormwater treatment system here. And between that, uh, the turbidity curtain and the tire wash system, um, we really didn't have any stormwater related issues. Um, everything was managed as far as that goes. So this was purely a, just a logistical nightmare to do. Uh, in the summer, you know, summertime, you're wearing Tyvek and stuff. So that was pretty nasty. You have to you know, go out and get a drink of water. If you've never worked on a site like this, if you want to go out, go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, you have to de decontaminate, uh, strip your Tyvek off and all that, and then come back in. So um, they had finally allowed us to wear shorts under our Tyvek because it was so hot. So these are just a few of the pictures of that. And um, yeah, this is bringing back really bad memories. Um, the site was really well characterized, but we still found half a dozen underground storage tanks like this one. And uh, we pulled it out and left a nice little mess. So that was fun. I learned all about uh, underground storage tanks, sucking them out pressure washing and nurting them a lot. And then we found a bunch of buried drums. So we had to call out a hazmat response. Um, mostly tar related, contaminated tar stuff, but some lick, some free product, volatile. I like this one, it's just kind of scary. And pretty much everywhere we would dig, we'd find something. Um, even at, in this area, we're down to the elevation we were told we needed to clean up to, and we had to over excavate, obviously. Same here, uh, just oozing petroleum product coming up through the soil.
oh yeah, we had another hazmat response. It turned out to be an empty propane tank. Um, we didn't get all the, the riverbank work done in the summer low time tides, daytime tides. So we had to come back in December for the nighttime low tides. And uh, it's amazing how cold it was down there. We actually had uh, decided to knock off a couple of nights because of snow, snow and wind. So this is one of those nights. I think I was 60 at the time. And it's amazing how much your hands hurt um, as you uh, get older. And we had a, uh, a neighbor's corner eco block wall fall in, almost uh, knocked somebody out. We had some truck issues like the duels coming off this truck. I don't remember why that happened. Uh, contamination coming out, sheen coming out from the neighbor's property that we had to do something about. And all kinds of cool artifacts like this. This is what it looked like when we were done. So 2014, we had planned on going right into a restoration project, habitat restoration when this was done. Okay, so the restoration project, we started uh, phase one, which is to the back of the, uh, the photographer here. Uh, and that was, I think, nine acres of riparian and intertidal habitat. And then this is the one we're working on now, which was the cleanup site. So this will all be riparian above plus 12 elevation and um, intertidal mud flat or marsh below 12. So this has been scooped out. Uh, the entrance out here where the sheet pile was removed, that is now at a plus eight and uh, water slowly drains out of this area. So this will be covered with marsh plants by the end of January. And all the slopes will be covered with riparian trees and shrubs. And then up on the north end, we've got Oh, this is looking from the north. Uh, these are the ducks that we had installed. And then uh, this, the very north end, we have uh, public access. We have built a pier. Um, and then these hopping stones or concrete piles, cutoffs for people to walk out. We've got a handboat launch and all that. So this is what we've turned or we're turning the uh, uh, super fun site into. So it's kind of fun. So I, uh, I spent 22 years at the port. I retired last January, but because this pro of this project that I've been waiting for for years and because the project manager and resident engineer left, I think in May or June, um, talked to my boss, I agreed to come back. So I came back a month and a half ago. Got another month and a half from working as the RE to get this thing completed. So, uh, so this is my last project and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, it sort of erases all the horror that the cleanup uh, uh, brought up. So anyway, so that's my silly presentation. Um, and if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, um, you can unmic, I think, and ask, or you can email me. And I want to thank you all for attending. Um, this will be posted if YouTube will allow me because I do have some things. I think they're all Creative Commons licenses, but I might get kicked out, but I'm planning on posting this on YouTube also, just for the heck of it. Uh, please check our website for information on membership and access to the YouTube site. And that's pnwciec.org. Uh, and again, send me an email if you have any questions or comments. So with that, I'm going to close out. Willie is going to hit the road.